From the realms of space now, we come back home to the realms of children and playgrounds. Daryl Hammond loves playgrounds. He's built more than 2,200 of them. He be began by founding Kaboom, a charity with a friend in 1996, and he's received multiple honors and awards for his work, including the President's Volunteer Service Award. In 2011, Hammond released his best-selling memoir, Kaboom, How One Man Built a Movement to Save Play. Daryl Hammond. Thanks, Tyler. Oh, great. You get to hear from a rocket scientist, an astronaut, and now a college dropout. <laughs> I do what I do because when I was two years old, my father, who was a cross-country truck driver, went to unload a truck. And my mom had just given birth to the youngest of us, eight Hammond kids. And my father never came back. And for two years, as hard as she tried, and after several nervous breakdowns, we became wards of the court. She made the hardest decision for her, but the best decision for me, and I went to a group home. And for 14 years, I was raised by an institution. I was a product of charity and philanthropy. Other people did for me what my family couldn't do for ourselves. Growing up at this place, participating in sports and arts and band and culture, and while traveling year over year to other schools and started to see it being eliminated. And they weren't given the same opportunities that these kids from the group home were actually given. I'm fortunate to actually have had 14 years of people giving me a bear hug and doing something so significant for me. When I was 23 years old and after having dropped out of college, and living on a friend's couch in Washington, D.C., I was reading the front page of the Washington Post with this headline that said, No Place to Play. And it was about two young kids, Aisha and Clendon, who in the heat wave of 1995 had crawled into an abandoned car like they had done every day for months and probably years with their dolls set up on the back, but this time they suffocated and died. A reporter from the Washington Post had saw a small blurb in a previous newspaper. And she was outraged that this wasn't capturing people's attention. So she went down to Anacostia. She tried to understand what was the story here? Why did this happen? But more importantly, why didn't people care? And after three weeks where she saw the residents pointing the fingers at each other, the mayor pointing the finger at the housing authority, the housing authority pointing the finger at the park and rec department. Nothing had gone on. She went block by block by block to try to figure out if they weren't in that car like they had always been, where would they have played? And it was within three miles that she could find the first park or playground. I didn't want to start an organization. I simply wanted to go down to that one community, to those two kids called Aisha and Clendon, who ironically were the exact same age that I was when my father left my family, and I went to a group home that gave me a big bear hug. Now, obviously, 17 years later, we've had the fortunate opportunity to work in almost 2,300 communities across the country. And what we've seen during that time is really two devastating trends. One, the makeup of community is changing. The makeup of our communities is changing. We don't gather as often together. And if we do gather, it may not be for this joyous pursuit called play. And when we think about play in America, this is something that, when you talk about it, it's hard to describe, but it's easy to know when you're doing it. Kids just aren't getting it. If we want the next rocket scientists and astronauts, those first 2,000 days of a kid's life is where their brain synopsis go out. 
But Tom Ferry, who wrote a book called Game On, went to discover that more and more kids are joining organized sports as young as two and three years old. Whereas just 10 years ago, they didn't start playing organized sports until six, seven, or eight, and just now, they're already dropping out because they're burnout. Instead of playing a variety of different activities, we're making them experts in one. They play soccer three seasons a year instead of soccer, basketball, or some other sport. Kids get somewhere in the neighborhoods of eight and a half hours of screen time a day, a computer, video game, some sort of monitor. I think there's a crisis of childhood that's happening and we need to do something about it. And we need to do something about it, not just for some kids, like me, but all kids, like Aisha and Clendon. Only one in five kids live within access to a park or a playground in the United States, yet you're 29 times more likely to be of healthy body weight if you do. We've got a crisis of childhood obesity in this country and we wonder why. We've got a crisis of lowering academic standards and we wonder why. I love to tell the story that many of you maybe have seen on the internet about a nine-year-old boy that didn't go off to soccer camp like he wanted to because his parents couldn't afford it like all of his other kids in the community did. He went every day to his father's auto parts store and he built a cardboard arcade. All summer long, he would build up these games out of cardboard. And on the last day, a guy shows up to get a handle replaced for the car he's trying to sell because he thinks he may get more money for it. And he pauses and says, what's going on here? And Cain asked him to buy a fun pass. And he spent $5 in this kid's arcade. And he was the first one all summer who did. Now Cain didn't know that Nirvan was actually a phenomenal filmmaker and made a video that has now been viewed millions and millions of times all over the internet. And I think there's two significant things about that story. The one is that the imagination and creativity of kids, when unleashed, can do amazing things. And the best type of play for kids is actually all type of play for kids. All type of play for kids. They need to be active with their bodies, particularly boys. They need to be active with their minds to figure out problems. And they need to be active together because that's where socialization comes from. I remember just a couple of years ago going home for Christmas and watching my nephews in a room who ranged between the ages of seven and 14. And they had this new language because they had video games in front of them and instead of talking, they would literally grunt to each other and they knew what they were talking about. <laughs> that's not the type of socialization that's going to help us figure out, communicate, and solve some of the problems that are facing our world and our communities. It's a simple antidote around Cain, but it's an important story about what play, creativity, and imagination can do. The other part of that story, which I like just as much, is that Nirvan, the filmmaker, paused to shine a light on this kid, gave him $5 for a fun pass, and then made a video out of it. Do we pause in our lives to shine a light on people who are less fortunate than us? Could we? And if we did, how might that fuel their desire, their passion, and their purpose, I think it would make a big difference. I'm here to plead with you that the fundamental stake of childhood has changed. And we're at a crossroads where we can do something about it or not. 
And if we don't create a new play norm, if we don't create a society and a culture where it's a lot of, a lot of different things in variety and fewer of the things like bullying, video games, TV watching, none of those in and of themselves is bad. But what kids are getting is too much of that and absolutely nothing else. We can create a new play norm simply by taking responsibility to do something about it. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a sibling, go outside with your kids every day. And the longer you do it, the better it'll be. The best prescription for boredom is repetition. And if they're bored, make them figure out something to do by themselves with somebody else. Because after doing that for a while, they'll know that there is no other alternative besides figuring something out. Now, I know that it's hard to think about me doing it, but where's the crowd? And my kid, is my community gonna be the only one to do it? The next thing we need to do is build more of this happening in our communities. The safest streets are the ones that people congregate on where people hang out and are doing the type of activities that are positive and build the type of future of healthy communities and healthy kids. It's not going to be easy. Frankly, it's going to be pretty hard. But in a generation, if we can look back and say, who's going to be the next astronauts, the next scientists, the doctors? Who's going to find problems to climate change? Who's going to find problems for the gun violence that's happening in our communities? And one of the ways that we change that is not to look to somebody else, but is to look from within and look to our neighbors and look to our communities to do something about it. I'm fortunate to have had a community wrap themselves around me. I'm even more fortunate to be able to work with the nonprofit Kaboom that has been able to inspire 2,300 communities to create safe places for kids to play. But I have this sense of urgency that it's not going to be enough fast enough, and we have to do something about it. And I know that I can't do it alone. And we have to do it, frankly, for the Aisha and Clendons of the world who can benefit from it most. We're on a new journey to talk about different levers that need to be pulled. And it can start with anybody in this auditorium tonight, today, tomorrow. What's your play quotient? Are you outside playing? Are you bringing your family and your community along with you to play? And if we start to do more of that, as simple as it sounds, it can create the type of momentum that's going to be needed. We are going to have to do things like find advocates to go into our school systems and bring back recess, which has been eliminated in almost 59% of schools across the country. And Liza Sullivan in Chicago found out that this was happening, Googled recess, our name came up, she called us and said, what can we do about this? And we said nothing, but you can do something about this. And we sat her on a path to go to the city council meeting, and she did. And she called us after the city council meeting, and she said, nobody listened to me. We said, go back. Bring somebody else with you. And she went back. And she went back over two years. And the day the city council was going to focus on this issue... 500 parents showed up. Recess was brought back into the Chicago Public Schools last fall. And the lesson that it tells us is that along this journey, we're going to need patience and perseverance because the change is not going to happen overnight. But it'll happen if we stick with it and build a large enough crowd. Please join me in being a part of that crowd here in Naples wherever your families live across the country, and let's make a new play norm 
so that all kids can reach their fullest potential. Thank you very much.